Good morning and welcome to this week's GROW where we gather to recharge, organize and work here as members of MWIG. We're glad that you're joining us today for our media literacy um, series that we do with our Director of um, Media Literacy, Meredith Gardner. Today, we are going to be talking about managing your news feed during times of conflict, which seems very timely as we have prepared this ahead of um, recent events in the last 24 hours. So I am gonna go ahead and turn the time over to Meredith to talk about how you can do that and how you can um, be a good consumer of media and information. Meredith. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Rachel, can you see my screen share still? Okay, just want to make sure. Thank you for um, thank you for joining us today. I'm really happy to be talking with you. And sorry for our screen share is going to be a little funky. We were trying to troubleshoot before we started, and we couldn't get it to go into presenter mode for us. So um, bear with me on this. Today we're going to be talking about managing your newsfeed um, during times of conflict, and we've been planning this topic for a couple of weeks now and um i just want to at the at the beginning of this acknowledge that this is a this is a difficult topic um i want to hold space for the fact that there's a lot of conflict in the news right now there's a lot of violence there's a lot of really heavy things um and that presents a lot of tension when it comes to becoming a good um consumer of media and so that's why I put this photo on here. This is actually a photo of a man who is, his name is um, Philippe Pettit. And in, um, I just wrote it down. In 1987, he walked a 200 foot tightrope over Jerusalem from the Arab side to the Jewish side. And he released a dove um, for peace. And um, I just love that visual of, the tension there and the striving for peace. And I think that's what we're doing um, as we strive to be more media literate about these difficult topics. Um, we have a desire to do good and stay informed. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And I understand maybe some people have some disagreements with what I say, and that's okay. Um, it's all about managing and doing um, what you feel is best with your own media literacy habits. So first, I just want to review um, a few points that I was able to pull from our MWAG principles of ethical government about what is our ethical duty when it comes to media literacy during times of conflict. And one of them that I pulled out is about war and that we strive to encourage nations to resolve conflict peacefully. We, instru we, stri we encourage individuals to do the same thing, you know, when we see violent events happen among individuals in in our own country or in other countries um, we also believe everyone has a duty to educate themselves about the actions of government officials during current events and that we have a responsibility to provide succor and relief for those who are victims of war and violence no matter what their race or religion or nationality um, so those are some of our kind of undergirding principles that we like to think about when we consider how can we be good um, citizens and good um, media literate consumers of news. And then we also can think about our moral duty. And I just pulled these from the scriptures that we're called to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those who mourn, comfort those that stand in need of comfort. And then we're asked to love our neighbor and ourself and I think the two um, from Matthew, the neighbor and ourself are really key in this discussion in that we have to be able to bear witness to the bad things that are happening, right? We don't want to shy away per se, but we also have to take care of ourselves. And there's that tension and that balance there um, as we strive to make good decisions about what we consume. Um, this is just a little bit about media literacy. What is media literacy? And I like to think about this too. Media literacy isn't just about consuming content. It's about knowing how to access it, how to analyze it, um, how to create ethical content, and also how to act 
um, as we digest that news and internalize it. So that we want to we want to keep in mind that full circle and that full cycle as we consider how we can be media literate in times of conflict and in as we see violent um, violent news happenings and stories from around the world. We want to concentrate on. Uh, on these points. Okay, now we're going to get into the meat of it a little bit. I wanted to talk about psychological warfare for a minute, because I think during times of war, this isn't always a topic that we think a lot about, but psychological warfare is the use of propaganda and influence campaigns to alter the will and actions of people on the opposing side. So during psychological warfare, it's been used in wars throughout history, um, different sides will target and attempt to manipulate people's most vulnerable feelings with the goal of causing demoralization and also with a goal of maybe altering um, decision making. Um, it often specifically targets soldiers, but it can also involve the broader public, especially today, now that we have the internet. And public support or opposition can influence political decisions. It can also lead to more violence or more peace. And I think we've seen that recently with some of the conflicts that have been happening is that um, people will see something on the news and it becomes very upsetting to them and there will be protests and there will be violence and there will be pressure on leaders to make decisions um, that maybe aren't always based on the best information. And that's that's part of what modern psychological warfare does is it uses social media. We can we can spread information and videos um, in an instant now. And it employs social media um, to try to change opinions and and demoralize people. And that's a part of war. I also wanted to talk about compassion fatigue. Um, this is a story I just pulled up, a screenshotted last night. Um, and this is actually about, specifically about Ukraine. Um, but compassion fatigue is a huge issue. And when we see violent images or hear about violent stories over and over again, um, we we get, it's it's a human, natural human response to kind of pull away and to feel like we're maybe overloaded and it's a form of burnout. Um, and so there's a lot of concerns about the war in Ukraine specifically and other conflicts, um, whether it be war or just violence, that people are getting compassion fatigue and they're not staying engaged just because they're burnt out on it. Um, so compassion fatigue, or crisis fatigue or trauma fatigue, sometimes it's called, um, can be characterized by feelings of numbness or lack of empathy or just this need to de detach from the topic. It can be very um, emotionally and physically draining. I know during COVID, a lot of people felt um, crisis fatigue from just hearing about you know, all of the news all the time, being stuck at home, um, stress is cumulative. And as it builds up and builds up, it has a negative impact on our, on our health, physical and mental. And what I found in doing research for this is um, there's not as much concern about people becoming like immune to violence. Um, like you see all these violent images and then they don't, they don't, it doesn't matter to you anymore. It's more, the concern is about feeling hope, hopeless or helpless, is that we, we see these violent images or videos and, or we hear these stories and we become overwhelmed and we say, what can I do? There's nothing I can do. And, and we disengage because of that. And that makes it really difficult to be engaged in the work of, work of peacemaking. Um, like I said before, we have to make sure we are caring for ourselves, we are loving ourselves, and we are caring for our neighbor. And so we have to find the right balance, especially now with social media, when there's so many violent images available and um, violent videos and stories and news is coming at us 24 seven. 
it's, it can become, it can be easy to become overwhelmed. So we're going to talk about some different ways we can combat that fatigue and make sure we're caring for ourselves, and also making space to care for our neighbor and still be aware. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about this misinformation aspect this time. We have done um, a grow on misinformation during times of conflict as well. And I think you could probably find that on YouTube in our Grow um, Media Library. Um, but there has been a ton of misinformation recently about conflicts. Um, and a lot of the forms that that's taking is really dated videos or videos from other locations that are labeled as being current and recent, and they're not. Uh, um, it's just, there's just a, a flood of it right now. And so it's really important um, to be aware that some of the content that we might see on social media is not accurate. And it's difficult for us because um, news organizations have a lot of ways they go about verifying photos and videos to make sure um, they're they're valid and they're current. And we as consumers don't really have that. Um, so we just have to be really on guard and aware that misinformation is a part of um, psychological warfare and that it's out there and that it can influence us. Um, so we just have to use our best our best skills and slow down um, as we consume information about conflict. Um, another thing that's come out last week in the New York Times, I had this screenshot it says a new report documents how easily children can access graphic images of war. They talked specifically about Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. Um, it's really concerning right now that social media filters, um, even with the filters turned all the way up, as of last week, they were not catching a large quantity of very violent content. And, and some of that, like I said, is misinformation. Um, so it's really important to be aware of the impact that can have on both adults and children. Um, it's, they're just not able to catch catch everything right now. I know they've been reporting that they're working on it. They're working on expanding um, their teams to try to catch violent images and content that that violate their terms of service. And, but they're also trying to balance um, freedom of speech and free expression on their platforms with the need to protect users. So they're they're in for a balancing act there. And that's just really important to be aware of. Okay, that leads us into talking about news ethics during times of war. So when I talk about news ethics, I'm talking about the ethics of professional newsrooms during times of war, about ethics of war correspondence and um, media outlets that have been established and might be considered legacy. Um, the Society of Professional Journalists um, has a lot of resources about reporting during times of conflict and violence. And their two guiding principles are to seek truth and minimize harm. So some these are just a few points that any good newsroom or reporter is going to consider as they decide whether to publish a story or a video or a photo. They're going to assess their motivation in publishing or not publishing. Um, they're going to think about the government and political actor motivation in providing information or withholding information to them. They're going to assess whether the information is reliable. And then they're also going to consider the consequences of publishing versus not and what the impact is of that. And I know that there have been times um, during different conflicts and, and times of violence. I can think, you know, I think about 9-11 definitely stands out to me. I think about um, war in places like Syria where um, violent images have ha that I've seen from that have stuck with me and definitely um, impacted how I viewed that event because images are so emotional and so powerful and speak to us in a different way than maybe just reading a story does, right? And um, so 
we're, good journalists know that images have power to tell a story in a way that words do not. And there's so many nuanced conversations that happen in newsrooms about what is appropriate to publish and what isn't, and what is the harm or good that is done in those decisions. And the important thing to remember with social media now is that social media accounts do not necessarily follow these ethical considerations. They don't think about whether um, whether the, the children in the videos or images are um, have given consent or um, whether the images are dehumanizing or even accurate. And so um, it's really important to, to do your best to stick to um, established journalists and newsrooms when getting your information as much as possible and not rely just on a social media feed um, just because they don't necessarily consider those same ethical um, considerations. They don't, they don't consider the impact that their images have as much maybe as professionals do. And, and even the professionals make mistakes. I want to totally acknowledge that. Um, but there is always a process of, of that decision-making. Um, images have a complex power, like I was talking about before. Um, I was reading some studies about um, how images of war, whether it be video or, or a photograph, um, affect people. And there's, there's a lot of nuance and complexity in that. Um, the way it affects people has to do with how people, how the viewer identifies with the group being shown, um, their own political viewpoints, um, their own perspective on war or conflict, all those things go into play with how they're affected by the image. Um, some people may feel empathy looking at graphic wartime or violent imagery, result of shootings or what have you, but people can also feel really helpless and hopeless or guilty or powerless. Um, and if there's too much of, of those negative feelings, people are gonna disengage from that topic. Um, people can be simultaneously moved by compassion and overwhelmed. And um, I know that there's been some studies that have said, and a lot of reporters and photographers will say, oh, we need these images so people can really see what's happening in this war, so people can witness. And I'm not going to tell anyone not to see or view. I, I'm not going to say to anyone, don't look at any images or don't witness, um, cause, because I don't think we need to go to that extreme. I just think we have to be aware of how much we consume. Um, because images can encourage anti-war sentiment or can influence our uh, understanding of what's really happening and what our brothers and sisters in other places are going through, right? But com compassion fatigue can also cause us to lose interest and to, to need to step back. Um, so like I said, there's that tension there and that balance there. Okay, I'm going to talk about a few practical ways to manage your, your newsfeed. Um, the first thing we talked about psychological warfare earlier on, it's important for you to be aware of your role in the information war, especially if you're a regular user of social media. Um, know that what you share or create can have real consequences. So it's important to slow down, to verify information, to consider the words that you're using, um, whether they are peaceful whether they encourage peacemaking, I should say, or whether they're dehumanizing, um, just keep in mind that that what we share and create does have real consequences. The second point is that when possible, limit how much you view and share violent images. Like I said before, I'm not going to tell anybody that they shouldn't view anything because I think images have an impact and tell a story in ways that are necessary sometimes. But it is important to also be aware that that they cause burnout, that they fuel burnout, and that they end up causing people to become disengaged if we see too much. You don't have to see large quantities of violent images to have compassion and witness victims of war. Um, 
some people might disagree with that. But I feel like if you want to remain engaged as a peacemaker in the long term, you have to care for yourself. And viewing too many violent images or videos um, is going to make it difficult to care for yourself. Um, if you see an image or video that causes you strong emotions or that, you know, seems like big breaking news, remember to SIFT. This is an acronym you use a lot. Stop, investigate the source, see where the information is coming from, what their credentials are. Find better coverage. That means checking to see what other organizations are saying about that video or source, you can also do like a Google image search or a Google video search, and then trace the image information back to its original source. Find out where it came from. Maybe that video was actually 10 years old and came from a completely different location and is totally taken out of context. Um, so just pause and remember to take, take these steps before you share something. Um, also, turn on your content filtering settings if you're seeing a lot of graphic or violent images, especially on um, especially on like uh, TikTok. And if you see um, any content that is misinformation or inappropriate, make sure you report that. Um, take breaks. So it used to be that like people had routines around their news consumption. They would wake up in the morning, they would get their newspaper, they would read it, and that was their news consumption for, for the day. Or they would get home from work and make dinner and watch the national news, and that was their news consumption for the day. And now people are able to consume the news all the time, 24 sevens on our phones. Um, you know, we have cable news stations. I would encourage if you're feeling burnt out um, for you to create a routine around your news consumption, look at the news during a certain time of day and then give yourself permission to take a break. Maybe you check on it again later, um, but you don't need to be constantly looking at it. And if you have push notifications on your phone that are giving you news all the time, and it's feeling overwhelming, um, feel free to shut those off for the time being. Um, consider dis disengaging from social media altogether. Um, if you're seeing a lot of content that is violent or related to conflict on your news, on your feeds, um, maybe just uninstall it for a little bit and instead go to trusted news outlets for, for news and information. And also something that gives us um, hope is if we're able to connect with causes that we care about in our local community. So if you're feeling overwhelmed and guilty and hopeless, um, find ways that you can engage in your neighborhood, in your city with that cause from a distance and do that thing. And that is a really healthy way of dealing with the stress of conflict and wanting to help. Also, it's really important to know, and I've seen this happen recently, um, is that breaking news can and often does change in times of war. That is the nature of war. Information is not always um, dependable. And so it's important to give news outlets extra time to verify information before you react or share. So if you see something, some atrocity that's happened that seems so awful um, and you just, you know, you're just devastated by it, um, that reaction is understandable. And I would also encourage you to leave a little space in your brain to know that if that's breaking news, we maybe want to give some time to outlets to verify it for more and more information about that. Maybe it will take a couple hours, maybe it will take a day, um, but give them time before you react and you share um, with something major and breaking. Um, for people who have children, I think it's really important for you to check in with your children. Um, if they have social media, ask them about what they've been seeing related to the conflicts in their feeds. Ask them whether they have questions about it, um, if they need to process it, if they're feeling overwhelmed. I remember being a teenager during 9-11. I remember seeing a lot of images from that that were really traumatic for me. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have anybody to process that with at that time. And it would have been really helpful for me. So I think if you can open up that conversation, uh, it would be really helpful to, to teenagers and older kids. If they're being flooded with violent images and videos, make sure their filters are on 
and they know how to report things that they are see or that are inappropriate. I know with recent conflicts, there's been a lot of organizations that have been encouraging parents to just take social media off of their kids' phones for a while. Um, I think, you know, depending on, on the parent, maybe that's necessary, uh, but it's just important to take that first step of checking in with your kids. Okay. And then finally, I just want to say that um, I want to bring it back to this, this man, this tightrope walker who, um, you know, oh gosh, this was almost 40 years ago that he did this and um, that he released this dove for peace and walked a tightrope um, and he had hope. And I think we can continue to have hope. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, um, I would just encourage you to take some time and take some deep breaths and know that there is hope in this situation. We can find balance. We can be engaged. We can connect and become involved in our own communities. We can um, make a difference in small ways and we can care for ourselves and our neighbors um, through our media literacy habits and through the ways that we engage it with our families and in organizations close to home. And that's what I have for you today. Is there anybody who has any questions? I don't think I have any questions, but I, I definitely feel like I sometimes fall in the, the helpless, hopeless mm -hmm. category. I know that for a while, um, you know, with Ukraine, I was following along and kind of keeping an eye on things. And then I kind of you know, donated to some organizations that I knew were doing good things and trusted. And then I just thought it's never ending or it's just getting worse or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of, I kind of start to, to spiral. Yeah. And, um, and so I kind of had to take a break and say, you know, I, rem I know this is happening. I know this is real, that this conflict um, exists, but I have to step back because there's only so much I can do from yeah. where I live, you know, and, yeah. but I can offer prayers. And I, I hate saying that in, in the way that I, you know, when you see conflict and you feel bad that there's public facing people that you say thoughts and prayers, but then you're like, but you're in a position, you can take some real action, you know? Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's, that's kind of like vacillate back and forth between those two things but I think it's a really good thing and we go back to checking the you know our media where are we getting our information and as you know you've done such a good job of sharing that information but we always want to remind people to make sure that you are doing balanced mm -hmm. consumption and that yep. you are checking where your facts are coming from is it a trusted source is it a little you know is it in the unbiased category Mm -hmm. what kind of because different different leaning news outlets are going to have different point of views and I think that we've done we've done I think a grow and where we've compared um the same story with like the headlines and mm -hmm. how the different ones and so I if you're if you're balanced then you're going to see it from different angles so I think that that's really important but um but I appreciate your thoughts on, of you know being thoughtful about what we're seeing when we're viewing it, if our kids are going to see it, are you talking about it? That's another thing is I thought, uh, did I have any discussions with my kids before they left for school that this might, you know, there might be other kids that are showing them stuff or yes. Yes. And, and, and they're watching it together, you know, socially as a group of youth during their lunch hour at school. And I'm not there to, to kind of moderate or answer questions or yeah. um, those kind of things. So I think, you know, just having, especially if you have teenagers that are a little bit older and understand um, and, and have access to social media or internet of any sort to kind of yeah. give them a warning because we maybe need to teach them these things too. As you know, as parents, we need to help them moderate and, and be mindful. So thank you for your thoughts and, and educating us on social media and all those things. So um, thanks to those that joined us today on our grow. And we want to invite you to join us next week. We are going to talk um, about MWAG's um, op 
our op lab. Why is that? No, our op-ed lab. <laughs> um, it just wasn't coming out of my brain right. Uh, if you are interested in writing an op-ed and you have been curious about how that works, please join us. Uh, as always, this grow will be in our on MWAG's YouTube channel and you can subscribe to um, the grow playlist and so you don't miss a grow. And we'll see you all next time. Thanks, Meredith.